coming up on Theater Talk. I remember being with Carol Channing in a hotel room in Chicago, trying to remember and learn the name of the interviewer who's going to be talking to her. And she just could not remember the person's name. And she would practice it over and over. She just sat there in the car going, Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And Susan, I'm delighted tonight to be joined by our friend, the legendary, we don't use that term lightly around here, the legendary Broadway press agent, Josh Ellis, who has taken his almost unbelievable but hilarious experiences with the likes of David Merrick and Lena Horne and Yul Brenner and turned them into a terrific one-man show. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you for having me as a guest. Now and, I must. And I want to hasten to add that Josh is no longer a press agent. You're now a minister, which I think is important to your story in some interesting way. And there is a crossover because I have done many theatrical <laughs> weddings, and doing a wedding is not unlike producing a show. It just lasts for 15 minutes. The thrill about it is that sometimes when I marry a heterosexual couple, I get the actual news a few a year or so later that they have a baby, and I go, wow, it wasn't a little show. It was the real thing. They really got married. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, all right, so your one-man show, it's called, what is the title? You Call get? My Publicist. Call My Publicist. The Starry Education of a Broadway Press Agent. Right, now, it's been performed a number of times around New York, but you don't have a set schedule for it. Not yet. That's the part that we're working on now. Right. I want to be able to do it regularly, and regularly means that people will be, yet, will be able to find it from one time to the next. Right. <laughs> Maybe we'll do it starting with once a month, and maybe a couple times a month, see how the audience it builds, and then hopefully have a gig that's continuous and also take it around the country. So this is like what the kids call a pop-up show. You know, they have pop-up stores and pop-up restaurants. You've got a pop-up one-man show. Now, distill us for us. What is it that a publicist does? Okay. These days, everyone has publicists. Right. They have different names. In the theater, we used to call them press agents. Mm -hmm. If you do it for the President of the United States, you're called the Press Secretary. Mm -hmm. If you do it for the Pope, your title is President of the Pontifical Council for Social <laughs> Communication. <laughs> but call it what you will, he is still a press agent. So basically, everything you hear, whether it's about Caitlyn Jenner or Bill Cosby or someone who's running for the President of the United States, it is being filtered through a press agent. <laughs> and that's it. And that's it. it. In politics, it's about getting elected. In the theater, it's about getting asses into seats. Right. Getting asses in seats is what you spent a much of your career. Yes. Uh, but you learned, as you say in the show, from the best, from the masters of it. And the master of press manipulation in your time was really David Merrick. I would say David Merrick and Yul Brynner and Carol Channing. All three in their own way and for different reasons and with different modus operandi. All right, so give us an example of the way Carol Channing manipulated the press. When she did interviews, she had made interview cards for every interview she did since the early 1950s. She knew everything about that interviewer before that interviewer came in from previous experiences. And when the person left, she would take a piece of information, personal information, that that person had mm -hmm. and then use it again if that, when she was interviewed yet again with someone. So she always seemed to know that person really well. And she would always call the person by their first and last name. Why Michael Riedel? Why Susan Haskins? <laughs> I remember being with Carol Channing in a hotel room in Chicago trying to remember and learn the name of the interviewer who's going to be talking to her. And she just could not remember the person's name. And she would practice it over and over in the hotel room, in the 
ta taxi or the limo, however we got to the studio. She just sat there in the car going, Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> <laughs> and but like and with Bruce Brunner, I mean, the, yeah, the what, challenge of The King and I was that it was a revival. Right. At a time when revivals were considered second-class citizens on Broadway. Right. And people would say to him, why are you doing this old war horse of a musical, The King and I? And he blew up. I mean, he was so angry. It is not a revival. <laughs> and he would go on and on to explain how relevant the material is in The King and I, men versus women, east versus west, and it made it sound brand new. Hmm. And because if you're at a press conference with the star of a show and the star blows his top, it pulls all the attention right to the subject, and people stopped calling it a revival. Hmm. I mean... So this was a carefully orchestrated explosion for the press totally, to be bamboozled. Totally by. planned. He taught me, as Merrick did, the value of strategy. And these, these strategy meetings were thrilling because it wasn't like just set up the interview. It's like, what do you want the interview to be? What's the purpose of it? With Carol Channing, it was like she would give the theater name, the phone number, the address. <laughs> and, you know, it was like, particularly if it's live, you know, they couldn't edit it out. And there, you know, there, there it was. With Brenner, it was about how do we publicize the show in a certain way? For example, six months into the show, he wanted to have an art gallery of pictures that the kids did backstage. He gives them crayon, a, a crepas, I think they called it at the time, and big sketch paper. Do beautiful pictures of our show. <laughs> and, and we had these fabulous children's drawings, and we put them up in the lobby of the Eurus Theater, where now the Theater Hall of Fame is. Yep, yep. And we had an now opening the night of the art gallery, and Euro Brenner was the curator. <laughs> so, I mean, you get publicity, and it was a device to keep the kids quiet backstage. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so it served, it served so many purposes. And Merrick was the manipulator of the press of all time. <sighs> I guess <laughs> the best example, of course, is the opening of 42nd Street, Famous. which I think I, may, I don't assume that everyone knows. Yeah. That, the director choreographer of the show, Gower Champion, died that morning and Merrick managed to keep it a surprise and a secret from everyone involved in the show until Merrick announced it during the curtain calls. Right. And it got an enormous amount of publicity. The challenge and the, 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 the strategy was that after Gower Champion's memorial service, I was not allowed to mention Gower Champion's name again even though the press was obsessed, at least for six months. How do you get the press to stop obsessing <laughs> about the about most dramatic Howard announcement Champion? in the history of Broadway? And we had meetings to discuss how you do it. Did Merrick not want it talked about anymore because he did not want death to be over the show anymore? Okay, well, yes and no. First of all, Merrick never explained. So, <laughs> you, I mean, you're working on the premise that David Merrick strategized and told me the why. I never knew the whys. I just knew the effect. Right. Um, a man who chooses to do the poster art of the show and chooses for the quote, the musical made in heaven, Time Magazine, <laughs> clearly is playing both sides <laughs> against the middle. I mean, the great irony of that quote was not lost on people who got it and totally not noticed <laughs> by people who didn't. Oh, I'm just getting is, it now, actually. You know, <laughs> musical made in heaven. <laughs> it's, that's Merrick's brilliance, you know, and... All right, but tell us of how you got off the death of Gower Champion, because that was a brilliant stroke okay. of yours. When you're challenged by someone like Merrick, simultaneously you have a kind of free will to come up with any idea. I mean, what the hell? The worst he can say is, no, I don't like it, you know, so, and... Or you're fired. Right, or you're fired. But <laughs> I remembered the most important lesson I learned from Eric all the way through 
was on this flop called The Baker's Wife, where during the flop of flops, this month, it loses money, it's out of town, it closes at the Kennedy Center. We're watching the show in the wings, and he says to me, oh, are we having fun? <laughs> and you go, he wants to have fun. That is the op, okay. So it's not only, in a, a, to answer your question, it's not just a stunt to get people's minds off Gower Champion. It's also for us to have fun. Mm -hmm. And I suggested an audition for the 1990 company of 42nd Street. A show that had opened in 1980. 1980. Right. So this was <laughs> going to be the cast in 10 years, when shows at that time did not run right. for 10 years. And I thought, well, it's really easy. We can do it in a rehearsal studio. We can do it with a piano, the dance captain. And little and, kids. And little kids. And he was like, oh, no, 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 no. We have to do it on the stage of the Winter Garden Theater. The curtain has to be down when the curtain, when the press come in, just like the show normally is. The little kiddies have to come <laughs> in their own costumes, made at home. When they come to the theater, the dance captain will teach them the opening routine, and then very slowly we'll raise the curtain <laughs> and our little to reveal our little preteen tappers. <laughs> now there were three hundred of them. <laughs> and packed onto the stage of the Winter Garden Theater. And the press ate it up. <laughs> um, except, I hasten to add, the New York Times, who said it was a blatant publicity stunt. <laughs> okay? So, eight years later, <laughs> two of those little preteen tappers actually re auditioned for their show and got into 42nd Street, which was still playing. <laughs> so, a fake press stunt. I can admit it now, it was a fake press stunt. Uh, <laughs> actually got two kids in the show. Merrick loved it, and we called it Fun in Merrick Land. And so I called up the New York Times person who had told me it was a blatant stunt. <laughs> she attended the event, but would not write about it. I said, well, now those two, two people are actually going into the show. And she said, it's old news. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing, I mean, I wanted to explain to people, people think when a press agent gets a show, they think of the final product. They think of the costumes, the sets, the lighting, okay? Would you like to see what a press agent gets when he first, he or she first gets a show, okay? I brought it with me, ah. okay? <laughs> That's this is what a show looks like, okay? What Whether it's Hamilton oh. or the biggest flop in the world, you get a script. Which one okay, is that? Okay, this one is Bring Back Birdie. Oh, you no know Hamilton. Which is not Hamilton. Okay, this was the sequel to Bye Bye Birdie. Okay, not a success. But the fact is, when, you, when you're a press agent, you get a script. And sometimes at the time, you got a cassette of the music. Mm -hmm. And this is it. I mean, it's not the finished product. And I would get calls from the press and say, we want pictures of the show with the cast in their costumes. And we'd say, the costumes aren't made yet. The set's not, it's being built. I mean, they didn't get processed at all. Yeah. That the fact is that we had to create an image for the show before the show existed. existed. Had, it, had an image. It had, no, had an image. it had no image. Or you'd have to get over an image that was created by people like into the woods. I mean, it wasn't, people would say, oh, that must have been really easy. It was not easy to sell. Into the Woods was right after Sunday in the Park with George, a show that was brilliant, got phenomenal reviews, and won the Pulitzer Prize, okay? Mm -hmm. But then I'm not sure that people, the real care. people really enjoyed it. No. So we're the, the, we're the next Sunheim show, Into the Woods, and I want to know how do we make it, how do we make sure that we can, under, people can understand, this is really fun. And it all came to, in, into how, how to sell it when I went to San Diego and saw it at the Old Globe before it came to New York. And how I knew it was gonna be a hit, I went to a Saturday matinee, loads of kids who were having the best time. They didn't know that it was Stephen Sondheim. They didn't care that it was Stephen Sondheim. They cared that it was just fabulous storytelling. And I figured if we have a show that appeals to Sondheim people and families and kids, you have a hit. All right, well, the show is called um, Call, My, Call My Publicist, and it's just going to materialize from time to time. All no, no, time. no, no, no. It's going to be carefully produced 
I learned, I truly learned, okay, on this one I had to learn to write it and to perform it, and now I want to learn. have it produced in a way that makes sense, that people can see it, that it can grow, because I love doing it, and I'm grateful that, you know, that I had your enthusiasm that says, you know, this is, it's, it's, and by the way, you're willing to travel, so anyone around the country seeing this thinks we would like to have Josh Ellis at our university, at our drama I program. I would love it. Call his publicist. <laughs> Call his publicist. Call my publicist. <laughs> Very good. the higher one. And it's a huge amount of fun. It it's is It's terrific. Fun. All right. Uh, Josh, good to see you. Thanks a lot for being our guest on the theater. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> on a blue and balmy Sunday, someone drops dead in the strand. And the man slips round the corner. People say, my kiss on hand. My good friend Eric Bentley, the drama critic and scholar and translator of Bertolt Brecht, just celebrated his 100th birthday. I went up to visit Eric in his apartment on Riverside Drive, and we're going to show you a little bit of my interview with Eric Bentley right now. So, Eric, we were just talking a little bit about your childhood. You grew up in uh, the town was Bolton. Yes. What, what kind of city was Bolton back then when you were growing up? Was it really still Victorian England? What I remember was the years of the Great Depression of 1930. Mm -hmm. I was 14 in 1930, so I, as I grew up, I was a child of the Depression, and I, I shared all the illusions of the younger generation. We were going to abolish the two chief threats, which was poverty mm -hmm. and war. <laughs> and we thought we could do it within mm -hmm. a few years. You can imagine how I feel when I look back <laughs> from this year. Did your family experience the Depression? My father was a small businessman who didn't do badly. His firm was furniture moving. Mm -hmm. And that was not very affected. Uh, although he had more money in the 20s than in the 30s. Right, right. So that uh, my eldest brother went through medical school with my father paying the fees. Mm. In, during the and, Depression. But uh, I was told when I was 12 that unless I won scholarships, there was no university for me. So I had, I had to win two scholarships to go to Oxford. Mm -hmm. In the 30s, before World War II, you were a pacifist, right? Yes, yeah. in the 30s, yes. Right. And when did you, when did you change? Because you did, you did serve in well, World War II. Well, uh, when the military call came, we were going to volunteer uh, to uh, ambulance service. But right. uh, otherwise, as a conscience has rejected Project, to right. the whole thing. Right. While I was here, I changed my mind as the war went on and England was threatened with, <laughs> with extinction. From Mr. Hitler. <laughs> uh, yes. I uh, let myself be available to the American draft oh. when that happened. Uh -huh. And I was rejected as a homosexual. Oh, really? So, <laughs> you were. So as I had got my whole thing together to go with the war, they wouldn't take me. I, I said at the time, they'd rather lose the war than win it with my help. <laughs> Where did you spend World War II? Did you go back to England or did you stay here in America? I stayed and uh, took one job after another, um, first in California. And if I'm not mistaken, it was in California where you first met Brecht, right? That's right. Uh, I had one year in California, UCLA. Mm -hmm dropped me as a dangerous character. <laughs> what? And, uh, what were you doing to cause trouble? Uh, when they let me know they were not rehiring really me at the end of the year, mm -hmm. I said, uh, why not? And they said, we don't have any reasons. So I went to the chairman and demanded reasons. And he said, you talk uh, about sex too much in class. <laughs> And uh, I said, I wasn't aware of that. Can you give me an instance of what I said that was wrong? And he said, uh, you were discussing Othello, and you were talking all the time about adultery. <laughs> <laughs> 
What the hell did they think the play was about? Uh, a handkerchief? I said Shakespeare began it. <laughs> <laughs> it's his fault, not mine. <laughs> what was Brecht doing out in California then when you met him? Uh, he'd only been in America a few months and was dependent on German friends uh, among the actors and directors. And this was the period when I got to know him through uh, a student that introduced me. Uh, I never heard of Brecht, although I was something of an expert on earlier German literature. Right, but you had not seen or heard or read any of his plays at that point. No, I, I was being introduced to a refugee writer um, who was hard up and needed a translator, huh. presumably free, <laughs> which I was yep. uh, for a long time. Was he a seductive person? Well, to me he was, but not in the sexual sense. Yeah, I... Many people hated him. He was that kind. Some people were fascinated by him. Mm -hmm. That included me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I gave him more attention than I have to any other writer. They gave me on a very thin paper some poems, and those were the first things I translated. Then later, I got he sent me the manuscript of of two plays which was uh, famous today the good woman of sets one and the um, caucasian chalk circle sure yeah and i did both of those a year or two later how was his english could he could he work with you on the translation at all or were you free to do what um, you wanted to do if you've heard his uh, recording for for the un american committee oh, yeah. um you heard a heavy german accent he actually knew more English than you would think because he suffered from insomnia. And uh, what he did was read uh, detective novels huh. in English. Huh. And he'd read a lot of those. And he began to be interested in uh, hesitantly reading the English classics like Shakespeare. When he came before the committee in uh, middle 40s, yeah. uh, he had a, an interpreter. They didn't really need it. Mm. Uh, that was for show. Right. Interesting. To, to be the German that didn't understand. Gave <laughs> him time to think of his answers. Clever. Very clever. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about Eisler, because this uh, CD coming out was the music of Eisler, and, and you, yes. would, you were a friend and a champion of his for years. Well, all older people remember Eisler for because he was in the headlines all over America for a brief period when his brother was thought, uh, was found to be an agent of the Soviet Union. That was when he was working in Hollywood. Right. And was, uh, he came before the committee and uh, his music was known to professional musicians like uh, Leonard Bernstein who was afraid of playing it because the, he was under observation, huh? surveillance right. by the FBI. It was mainly a political phenomenon, but I became aware that he'd done more f in the interests of Brecht and was uh, a great admirer of Brecht. His whole grown-up life, except at the very beginning, he worked on Brecht poems and plays. Uh, it was a far bigger story than the Court Vile, yeah. uh, which uh, produced a couple of masterpieces. Yeah, yeah. But then they went their separate ways. Whereas Eisler stayed very close to Brecht. He adored Brecht. Mm. Whereas Kurt Vile despised Brecht. Vile uh, thought he was an unpleasant man but gifted writer. What did Lotta Lenya think about Brecht? She hated him, a very bad man. I think there was a fundamental difference in character between Kurt Weill and Lotta Lenya on the one hand and Brecht and his various women on the other. Hmm. They were 
two different mentalities. Just a couple last thoughts, Eric. Uh, this is coming up on 100 years <laughs> for you. Uh, yes. <laughs> Any, uh, uh, is, there a, is there a secret to it? I mean, any advice you can give a 50-year-old like me to, to clock another 50 years on this planet? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it just happens? <laughs> uh -huh. No, it's something that either happens or it doesn't happen. Nobody knows. If there's a secret, we, it's a secret from us all. <laughs> you have no fear of death, right? We used to talk about this. No, I don't believe in uh, an afterlife. I think that's a, a great fantasy. So I'm not afraid of hell. <laughs> but I don't think there is any such place. <laughs> Uh, so this means there is only death itself to be afraid of, if you are. Death itself is just something that happens, after which you are nothing, uh, expect to be nothing. My favorite remark about death was made by Lyndon Strachey, where he lay dying. He said, if this is death, I don't think much of it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. I think we have enough there. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.